Welcome back, WNST, Towson, and Baltimore, and Baltimore positive, all things calm and local. And I tell you, I, I got friends all over the country. Uh, it's a blessing. I mean, I've been to all these cool places and places I can't get on an airplane and, and go visit. I, I had some thoughts of going to see the Rolling Stones in Jacksonville and seeing my elementary school teacher. She's my my uh, my my kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Wassel, lives just north of Jacksonville, Florida. But this guy is a real Baltimore guy who made a life and a living down in Jacksonville for many, many years uh, as a sports director down there at WJXT. He is uh, now a bit of emeritus and doing Sunday columns at the Florida Times Union, and he's got Sam Sports Line. But once an Oriole fan and once an admirer of Earl Weaver and Johnny Yu, always there. Sam Kavaris joins us back here in the Charm City from Jacksonville, Florida. We're, you know, we're worried about your COVID rate down there, and Trump says he's going to come in and take over, and we're going to have a convention, and we got all sorts of things going. Are we going to play football? Are we going to play college football, pro football? And last I checked, you missed the Masters a couple weeks ago, which is unheard of for you, Sam, you know? <laughs> Yeah, this would have been my 40th, and um, we'll see. Uh, you know, I'm scheduled now for the second week of November. But, uh, yeah, you think back on all the different times that, that, that you've been to Augusta. Actually, I've been there 41 years, but one year I sent my weekend guy up as a reward, and I went as a fan, so it really doesn't count. And in 1982, my oldest daughter was born, and even my wife said I couldn't go that weekend. So I uh, – <laughs> This would have been my 40th, and it may it may still happen here in November, but that'll that'll be good. And you know, I don't think I've ever mentioned, and I don't even. I guess it's still there. I went to Featherbed Elementary School in uh, Woodlawn, and then Woodlawn Junior High, and then Woodlawn Senior High before I transferred uh, to a school in uh, in DC when my dad got transferred. But uh, Featherbed you know, about- Lane Elementary School. Uh, yep. Yes, this is. Uh- uh, Woodlawn Drive, yeah, uh, Gwen, Gwen, uh, West Glen. There we go. Yeah, Windsor Manor, right, right near Martin's. I, I know exactly where that is. Yes, right near, right near Martin's. That's exactly right. Yeah, I would was, say uh, Monahan's is right around the corner from there. My man Jack Milani, right around the corner. So <laughs> give a shout used out. Used to be there. a, used to be a little family, not a, not a grocery store, but uh, like a convenience store. Euler's used to be at the top, right there. Uh, uh, at the top of the road on, I guess that's Windsor Mill Road that runs up there, right? So, yeah, absolutely. That, that, and you're right around agent. the corner from Coons yeah. Florida Security Boulevard, one of our great sponsors in Woodlawn. Sam, there I mean, you your background here and, and sports and what we've done, I guess the, the jumping off point for everybody is, because I didn't do a sports conversation for four months. I almost ran for mayor. I've been doing Baltimore Positive stuff for a long, long time, 18 months. Uh, they took football away. They take baseball away. I never thought of a life where there would be no sports for three months, six months, eight months. Or I, I, there, there's no pandemic playbook for this, for these leagues, for anybody. But just sort of the weirdness of you know watching Jerry Sandusky, you know, read non-scores every night. It's we're in a whole different place, aren't we? <laughs> Boy, that's so true. And you, know, you have to go back to 1918 before the NFL and before the NBA were even formed where you had this many days without a professional sports game. Uh, the, the World Series that year ended on September 11th, uh, 1918, and then the NHL played uh, their, in their second season on December 21st, 1918. So that was 101 days. Now we're, we're into 100, uh, 120 days so far without professional sports of the four major sports leagues. And, in fact, my column this week is, so what are you watching on TV? I mean, I'm sorry. I refuse to watch Cornhole. I don't care if it's a <laughs> championship game or not. I'm not, I'm not watching that. Uh, Remember the uh, old ESPN where they would do log rolling and, like, yeah, Ken Patera yeah. would show up with the world's strongest man competition and <laughs> they'd have Gaelic on at 2 o'clock in the morning from Scotland or something, right? My, my favorite was when – Guys used to stand, and Bob Beatty and an announcer would stand in front of a chroma key covering a skiing event. They'd be standing in Connecticut. The event was over in, uh, you know, Innsbruck, uh, over in Austria. <laughs> in Innsbruck, exactly. And they'd be standing in front of a chroma key. But that, you know, that may be where announcing is headed. And a lot of the. the That's where journalism's headed, right? I mean, when's the next time you're going to be in the room with, with the Jaguars coach? That's not happening anytime. I mean, I'm not going to be That's in a room exactly with John right. Harbaugh for a long, long time. 
Yeah, we've, miss done, we've probably done a, a half dozen Zoom press conferences with Doug Marone here. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see how different journalistic, quote unquote, organizations approach this in the future, because you look at even what CBS is doing with golf. They've got announcers in five different remote locations. You know, that wasn't possible uh, 10 years ago. But when the advancements in, in fiber optic technology and and uh, the, the ability to, to have people in different places and to have them appear that they're in the same spot now is, uh, you know, it's going to cut down on travel costs. And it's also going to give news organizations an excuse to not send people to cover different events uh, that they've already kind of moved into. It's kind of a it's going to definitely color how decision making decisions are made. In this uh, in this new time, Sam Kavars has been my friend a long, long time of Woodlawn, of Featherbed Lane, a uh, long time Jacksonville insider. He is the Jacksonville Pro Football Hall of Fame voter. Have you always been that guy? Did Vito ever do that? I, I you know, I I know of you doing it, right? But there, there have been like at larges, but you've been there a long time, man. Yeah, I'm I'm the only I'm the Jacksonville representative now, 26 years into that, and Vito. Delino, who's a Hall of Fame voter, who is also in the Hall of Fame, won the Dick McCann Award in 1990 when he wrote for the Baltimore Sun, in fact, is, a, um, is an at-large voter uh, of one of the 48. When I first got on the committee, it was 32 guys, which was 28 representatives of, of teams in the league and then four at-large representatives, and people like John Stedman and Edwin Pope and Tom McEwen and Will McDonough were, were Jack Buck were, were on there. Now the, the committee has gotten a little bit younger, much more stats oriented than it used to be. It used to be much more of an eye test. You know, Floyd Little may have only slightly better stats than Don Perkins. Floyd Little's a Hall of Famer. Don Perkins was a very good running back, but Floyd Little's a Hall of Famer. So th- those are the kinds of things that 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 have changed in that in that particular committee these days it's much more stats oriented than it than it used to be and part of that is the way that that sports have developed in general in how how people view them well you know did the guy have five yards per carry or four yards per carry did he have you know how many thousand yard games that he had well a thousand yard game that thousand yard season meant a lot when there were 12 and 14 games in the NFL, now there's 16. You only got to average like 83 yards a game in order to have a, a thousand yard season. So different kind of di- different uh, measuring sticks now for for players in this particular era. This is a particularly tenuous time, I think, for your metropolis and my metropolis. We have one year left on the Orioles' lease, Sam, which means that you're 30 years older, uh, you know, since they left Camden Yards and so am I, uh, or, or left 33rd Street to come to Camden Yards. Uh, one year left on the lease. Uh, your Jacksonville situation, I, I've i always felt like that thing's been dangling for Europe or whatever, and whatever they're going to do with the Chargers in the end, because that's not going to work. And now all of this gets one giant timeout, right? Like where fans aren't going to be coming, or it's going to be such a limited thing. Travel, all of this stuff. The Europe games are blown up now for the league. This has really been uh, a crisis management test for everyone in the world. And the NFL has been the big dog here. And I think everybody's waiting. And uh, you go back far enough to remember Kennedy getting shot. I don't, but I remember 9-11. And, you know, we looked at baseball and football. And, hey, Cal Ripken and Mark McGuire, come and save us. And, you know, and, and after crises and all this stuff. We're looking to sports to save us after this crisis. I don't know. We got an election in November. We're in the middle of a pandemic. I don't know that baseball, I mean, football maybe, but I'm really worried they're going to rev this engine up and the engine's not going to go, and you're down in a state that they're shutting down again for a holiday right now, right? So I I am deeply concerned that we're a little too optimistic about them playing because I don't think they can do this safely, Sam. Well, I I, I agree with you, and is, is, the, is the goal to flatten the curve or to save everybody from getting COVID-19? And that that's, the that's of course, the, the big discussion these days and when people think of florida and the news media i read an article in the washington post that had a 12 year old picture of the beach here in jacksonville and was the single most disingenuous piece of well i won't even call it journalism that i've ever read it was clearly written by somebody who'd never been here and when people think of florida you know people think of miami and fort lauderdale well those are 
those are very separate from the rest of the state. And the, um, the things that, that are happening here in Duval County and St. John's County, between those two counties, we have 63 miles of um, nearly uninterrupted beaches. St. John's County has 42 miles of uninter- uninterrupt- uninter- uninterrupted beach. There's, there's an easy way to social distance there, and people do. It's not the pictures that they continue to show on those, um, I won't even call them news channels any longer. So you, you have to kind of separate fact from fiction when you're really looking at it. And yes, are they having problems in Miami Beach and, and in Fort Lauderdale and Hallandale? Yes, they are, because people are not following some of the regulations. But in North Florida, we're, we're in a very different, very, very different situation than, than they had there. I agree with you, though. I'm not so sure how baseball, with 30 different venues and 60 games, is going to be able to protect the players. They're not putting them in a bubble. They're not putting them on a campus. They're, you know, they're going to be out and about. There's, there's certainly going to be positive tests. Jay Monahan, the commissioner of the PGA Tour, has said that if there's enough positive tests, that they will stop. Well, what's, what's the number? The fourth player and the well, fifth Well, we've had governors all over the that. country yeah. set a number in the middle of March and then change their minds at the end of April, right? right? You know exactly. So, the, so I think it's very. I think it's going to be very difficult to uh, to do that. And you know, these are a lot of very, very healthy, very strong people. And you know, if they contract COVID nineteen, it may not have an, an impact on their lives. It may have an impact on the people around them. The one thing about the NFL. And remember, the Jaguars were scheduled to play two home games in London this year, and I find it very interesting that they haven't commented at all on the fact that all of their home games are going to be played in Jacksonville. That um, 15% of the total revenue of any NFL team comes from ticket sales, which means there's a lot of money flowing through these particular organizations that have nothing to do with ticket sales. And when you add up all the TV money, it covers the full operational cost of any NFL team, whether it's <clears throat> travel or salaries or uh, administration, whatever it the is. The rest of it's the gravy. Exactly. So that's why owners are so interested in club seats, and sky suites, and, and add-ons, because that all goes directly to the bottom line and in their pocket. So the question is, I think they're going to play NFL football with or without fans. College football is a different story. 75% of the revenue – derived from college football comes from ticket sales and think of all of the different organizations, particularly sports organizations that are supported on campus by the football program. You know, there's other non-revenue sports that, that are able to able to kind of exist because football I mean, come on, the Nebraska and uh, Alabama football programs are half the state's GDP for crying out. Loud. Exactly. Literally. So, you know, when you look at how the conferences have set up the TV contracts, not the schools, with the exception of places like Texas that has their own network. But, you know, you're talking about a real question mark as to whether or not they're going to be able to play college football this year, despite everybody talking talking big. And the NFL said yesterday that teams are going to report to camp on July 28th. You know, I, I'm I'm just sitting here waiting because I agree with you. I'm not so sure that all of this is going to come back seamlessly and um, – and just capture people's attention, and we're going to go on. I think it's still going to be very different. Well, one day I'll get down to see the Stones in Jacksonville. I've tried a couple of times. You know, my uh, my kindergarten teacher lives in Yulee. You familiar with that? Very familiar with Yulee. Yulee is the town just outside of Amelia Island. Well, it must be nice. I mean, right. my, my... That's where the Ritz is. Yeah, the Ritz-Carlton is right there at Amelia. Nice. Well, I'm going to nice. stop at the Ritz. Yeah. We'll get some coffee together, lay on the beach, and I'll uh, I- I'll see my kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Wassel. It's always good to visit with you, Sam. I, I wish we had, you know, baseball to talk about and things to talk about, but uh, hopefully we uh, have a better country and a safer country and a healthier country and all that stuff the next time you and I get together to talk some football. All right, bro? You know, the, I can tell you this. We're, by every measure, we're on opposite ends of the spectrum. The Ravens are considered favorites, maybe one of the most talented teams in the league with a solid quarterback situation. The Jaguars, by every measure so far, by the way, don't have a player over 30 on their roster, and they traded the best guy and the best player on the team to the Ravens in Calais Campbell. I don't know if you've had a chance to be 
He's about the best guy you'll ever meet. Well, I, 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 I will never meet him. I, I've seen him on that Zoom. Said, That's yeah. all. Yeah, I, he's, I've met he's him at the Super Bowl, though. Yeah. And he won the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award, of course. But, you know, the Jaguars are picked. You know, the over-under is four and a half in Vegas for wins. The least talented roster, the unsettled quarterback situation. Who knows what's going to happen, you know. I do know that a 60-game season gives the Orioles a chance. To win 20. <laughs> Sam, I love you. Be good, bud. All right, take care. Man. Sam Cavaris, there he goes. Uh, he's down there in Jacksonville, Florida. You can find him at samsportsline.com as well as the Sam Cavaris. That's K-O-U-V-A-R-I-S. And old, young old-timers, as Stebman would say, will remember Sam Cavaris of Woodlawn. Nasty at WNST.net finds me. I'm pimping to Harka ice cream. I have not had a mouthful of Honey Graham ice cream in three weeks, and they're my sponsor. I'm coming to join you at Taharka, also our friends at Pizza John's, where I get to get over there and get myself a little mushroom and pepperoni. Mushroom pepperoni is where I'm going to go this week, and I'm also going to stop over to Al's Seafood, pick me up two dozen. Chris Pike and I are going to eat some crabs this week for the 4th of July together, blog and tackle. He loves him some Sam Cavaris as well. So uh, all these Baltimore guys, I mean, St. Joe guys sticking together with Woodlawn guys and Dundalk guys. I'll even let Moeller hang out here from Catonsville. Don and I had an unbelievable day together on Tuesday talking to a, a wide variety of folks. You'll find all of that at Baltimore Positive. I am Nestor. We are WNST.net, AM 1570, calm, local like Sam Cavaris, and Baltimore Positive. <laughs>